Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I am um, Sarah Krakoff, and I am on the faculty here at the University of Colorado Law School. And uh, I'm also board chair uh, for the governing board of the Getches Wilkinson Center. Um, and uh, I'm an associate dean at the law school, and I'm only mentioning that last one uh, because among my other duties are to stand in for our dean, Jim Anaya, who unfortunately could not be here. Um, he conveyed his sincere regrets. Uh, he is a big supporter and fan of the Getches Wilkinson Center, and we, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess he didn't pay the electricity bill, so. <laughs> um, uh, and wanted to convey to all of you um, that he is excited about the program tonight um, and is grateful for all of your attendance um, and support. And in particular, I um, wanted to acknowledge Brian Dolan, who is a sponsor of this symposium and everyone at the law school is very grateful for that. Um, there are a few other specific sponsors I'm also gonna acknowledge in a second, but um, I just wanna say a very um, few words about the Getches Wilkinson Center, and in particular to focus briefly on its namesakes, um, one of whom was David Getches, uh, the late dean, uh, mentor, professor, uh, and friend to many of us leader in the fields of water law, natural resources law, and also American Indian law. Uh, among other things, he helped to found the Native American Rights Fund with John Echohawk, who um, we're always honored to have with us as we are tonight. Um, and I'm saving the most salient for last. Um, David Getches was the executive de director of the natural resources department at the state of Colorado. Uh, and so it's very fitting that to, at this March symposium, we have Dan Gibbs, um, the current executive director for the Department of Natural Resources. And so that's a really nice connection, and I know David would enjoy and appreciate that. Um, the second namesake of the center, uh, we are thrilled, delighted, and appreciative is with us, uh, literally, uh, here, still with us, of course, but also literally in the room. I saw Charles come in, and there he is. And, and just I wanna say briefly about both Charles and David, is um, that they have spent their careers in the fields, overlapping fields of natural resources and American Indian law, um, both as leaders on the academic side, teaching generations of uh, students who become fanboys and girls. Uh, and I know, because I have to hear about it all the time still. Um, um, but that's a pleasure too. But also who took uh, their roles as public servants very seriously uh, in different ways. For, for David, it was to go in and out of government, and it was for Charles, and still is, uh, as he stays in the academy, to always have a foot in the real world of natural resources, public lands, and American Indian law making um, law reform on the ground with tribes and Indian people, um, and depending on the issue, non-Indian people too. Uh, so that just gives you a little sense of what the center is all about, the role that it plays here in the law school, and um, why it's, again, very fitting uh, that we're starting the MART Symposium with this discussion between Alice Madden and Dan Gibbs about real natural resources issues here in Colorado, live right now. Um, a couple more things I want to say. Uh, Alice is going to do more to introduce Dan, but um, I want to introduce Alice, who also continues in that same tradition of one foot here with us uh, in the academy and another foot in the world of politics and advocacy. Alice, in addition to being a graduate of the law school and then uh, a, a lawyer in private practice for some years, um, was a very important public servant for the state of Colorado. She was served in the House of Representatives um, and then uh, was the majority leader in the House after she had helped to engineer um, the takeover of the House by the then majority party, which we won't name because you know we don't want to be partisan. But, but that's some about Alice's background. And then she worked for Governor Ritter in his uh, climate and energy office 
and also in uh, the Department of Energy under Secretary Moniz under the previous administration. So, um, so it's, it's quite an illustrious crowd we have um, with us tonight. And uh, I do want to say just briefly also a word about Clyde Martz, for whom the symposium is named, um, who in a way got this whole thing going. <laughs> I mean, this model of being a law teacher and professor and public servant and someone who makes real life public policy and law, um, and also uh, who leaves a legacy with us here at the University of Colorado Law School. Um, Clyde was a lawyer in private practice at Davis, Graham, and Stubbs, um, but he then also periodically uh, took leaves of absence to serve as the Assistant Attorney General of the Lands and Natural Resources Division in the Department of Justice. He was also in the solic solicitor's office and served as the Colorado Special Assistant Attorney General. And those are all labels, but anyone who knows Clyde's career knows that he also litigated some of the landmark cases in public land law. Um, and so uh, we are hoping, of course, always to honor Clyde's legacy here at this March symposium. Um, and last um, but not least, um, I want to thank our sponsors for this event tonight and also for the conference tomorrow, um, Davis, Graham, and Stubbs, Newmont, the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation, Wilmer Hale, Wilmer Cutler, uh, P Pickering, Hale, and Door. Um, that really two separate, I shouldn't say, <laughs> two separate law firms, I guess it is. Um, so we want to thank those sponsors very much for their support of this program and for the conference tomorrow. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to Justin Pideau, um, who is a, a law professor at the University of Denver, but was visiting uh, here at CU in the fall, teaching public lands and administrative law, who helped to pull together uh, the conference for tomorrow. And I hope you all will come to that as well. It's just an amazing array of speakers talking about all of these issues that are very important to us and live right now. Um, okay, well, thanks. Um, and now that's all for me. And now on to the main event. Um, thank you, Alice and Dan. Okay, the test. Are these, yeah. are these on yet? No. Okay. Hello, hello. Oh, there we go. There we go. Is mine on? No. Okay. Well, Dan's the more important one. But. Oh, no, no. Hello. Does that get better? Hello? 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 I can see her over there. She's looking at me. <laughs> Hello? I might start singing soon if I sit down. <laughs> snow, snow, snow. On yet? Oh, bummer. Especially <laughs> Thank you, how's that? All right. So first of all, thanks to Sarah. She's, a, um, she's the chair of the Getches Wilkinson board. She's a beloved professor, um, and she's one of the many people who make my job here terrific. Uh, we have members of um, the advisory council to the center here and a few of our senior fellows. Would you all mind, and Castle, Maryland, would you all just mind raising your hands? And I want to just thank them for the volunteer time that they put into the advisory council and the senior fellows. So I just want to thank them, and I'm really glad you are all here. So um, uh, rather than read Dan's bio, which I hate it when people read my bio, and he said the same thing. So um, we're going to just incorporate his past as, as we talk. Um, so I'm going to ask him a little bit of himself, and he can talk about how that experience <clears throat> has informed him for this job. Um, and just a couple of overviews. Uh, tonight we're going to hit water, forest health, challenges facing our parks like overcrowding, and what I think a lot of people want to hear about um, is oil and gas. And as you know, timing is everything, and the omnibus bill in the state legislature was actually announced today which was great timing. We didn't know if it would happen or not, or I didn't know if it would happen, and we'll get to be able to talk about that. Um, we're gonna um, give ourselves about 10 minutes for question and answer. Um, there's index cards that, that will be passed around, and at, when you're done writing your question, I'm just gonna ask people to forward them to the aisles and hold them up, and um, Tara or Sean will come get them, and uh, we'll do some Q&A. We are a university or a law school, so we always try to choose a student's questions first. So any students who write down a question, just put your name and year, and, and we'll make sure we uh, get your uh, questions up to the top. So 
Uh, congrats <laughs> on the new position. Uh, did you get through the Senate already? And you're all you're all Somehow official, right? I squeaked through. There yeah, you go. No. <laughs> um, so um, Dan and I served together, so I know a lot about Dan. But why don't you tell everyone a bit about your background, and then we'll dive into DNR. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I. Um, you know, as a kid, grew up just like many of you probably in the room, wanting to be outdoors as much as possible. And so spent time, you know, uh, hiking, mountain biking, um, every possibility I could do just to uh, enjoy the outdoors. Um, um, where we lived in Gunnison was just west of town, where the Gunnison River literally came to our back door and turned 90 degrees. And so it was amazing fly fishing. We always had at least two or three chocolate labs um, running around um, the house and in the backyard. Um, you know, being outdoors was just part of, of my fabric of kind of who I am. And I ended up uh, studying at Western State in Gunnison. I uh, was involved with the mountain rescue team there, was um, worked as an outdoor adventure guide and took people everything from ice climbing to winter camping to whitewater rafting, uh, kayaking, uh, you name it, I was involved with that. And, um, you know, I, I started to get an itch to be involved with, with um, some, some way in, in public service or public policy. I wasn't really sure how that would fall. But my boss at the time for an organization I worked for called Wilderness Pursuit said, hey, you should contact this guy, Mark Udall. I, I used to work with him at Fraught Bound. And believe it or not, he just got elected as congressman. I don't know how that happened, but you should contact this guy. And, um, and you all know he's your former you know, congressman for this area of Colorado that became a senator. Um, anyways, I, I sent my application in, um, got hired. I worked for him for about six and a half years. I, I was in his Westminster office originally, then went out to Washington, D.C., and then came back home to Colorado. I had the best congressional office that I ran, I think, ever in a little town called Mintern. You all know Mintern? Just right outside of Vail. So, uh, I was that guy that got to run the office for Mark Udall um, in Mintern, and very different from wearing a suit and tie in D.C. to, to that. And then 2006, um, unique opportunity came my way where Gary Lindstrom, that was a state representative that, that, that served in the legislature, decided to run for governor, and that opened up a seat for state rep. Well, I ran for that, and, and I was successful in that. I really one day looked at myself in, in the mirror and said, you know, why not me? I had worked for a congressman for years. On, on helping to advise him on, on federal policy. And, and I knew that I could work really hard for the people in, in that particular district. So I, it's scary when you decide to, to run for office. You, you're kind of like, hey, you're, you put yourself and, and, and your family really on the line in many ways. And um, I was successful with that. So I served as a state rep for House District 56. I included Summit, Eagle, and Lake Counties. Uh, served on the Ag Committee and Transportation Committee. And then uh, another unique opportunity came up um, where Joan Fitzgerald, who was then the Senate president, um, decided to run for Congress. And that, in that um, capacity, there were three people running, Jared Polis, Will Shafroth, and Joan Fitzgerald. And so Joan decided to resign her Senate seat, and I was appointed to fill that vacancy in the Senate. And then I ran for another term. And, um, and then after that, um, I opening came up for county commissioner. I was really kind of, didn't really want to travel um, the six county area anymore for the Senate district. And I thought I could really make a difference at the local level. And um, fast forward a little bit, I um, was elected, um, you know, three times um, as a Summit County Commissioner. Three, three terms is a term limit, but I served actually um, maybe three days of my third term because on my way out to actually get uh, sworn in um, to, for my third term. It was on a Tuesday at about 8.10. My wife, Johanna, that's over here in the green, and, and my little boy, Tate, who's 18 months old, and, and my daughter, Grace, that's four and a half. You know how hard it is when you have kids trying to get out the door. I was scheduled to get sworn in at 8.30 when I got a call from Jared Polis. And uh, of course, I answered right away, but, but Jared said, um, you know, Dan, on behalf of the great state of Colorado, I'd like to offer you the job of executive director of the Department of Natural Resources. Will you accept? And of course, I accepted, and um, it's been a crazy ride ever since. And I think we'll talk a little bit about um, the department and so forth. But, um, you know, in, in general, um, uh, um, you know, natural resources, I, I think every day about my kids, um, about the next generation and how we have such a unique opportunity in this role 
uh, of shaping policy in the state of Colorado. And it's a, a huge honor to, to work for someone like Jared Polis that when I meet with him, he is um, literally every day I, if I meet with him, he's, he's like, Dan, what bold creative ideas are you trying to bring to natural resources? And how do we get there? And so it's just so exciting to, to be in this environment right now where uh, he wants to be bold, he wants to lead, and he wants me to help carry out his vision for Department of Natural Resources. And obviously, you're incredibly qualified and was thrilled to hear that you're doing this. Um, I, I loved um, Governor um, uh, Candidate Polis ran on Keep Colorado Wild, mm -hmm. which I just thought was, a, was a, 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 a great agenda. And now you're in charge of that. Um, and you've worked on a lot of these issues in your past. Um, and I know, uh, matter of fact, when we served together, you were one of the first people to run a bill to require protections around wildlife yeah. in oil and gas drilling areas. So you've been walking the walk for a long time. Um, I know we wanted to start with water issues. Um, so we have a new governor, a, um, a new majority in both chambers in, in Colorado. Uh, there'll be a not, lot of new appointees on various boards, particularly after July, I think, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of flux right now, but our challenges remain the same. Uh, the Colorado uh, River is oversubscribed. We have a growing population. We have climate change. We're in an era, an era of what people are now calling permanent drought. So um, I'd like to hear a little bit about your priorities and also how you work with the, the water community um, um, knowing, and I'm sure there's some, you know, worry, but also optimism about what's going to happen, but there's a lot of changes going on. Yeah, yeah. So in particular with water, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you know, looking at water, it's, as you mentioned, there are huge needs. I mean, we're looking at the state of Colorado, as many of you know, we're, we're expecting huge population growth. So about 80,000 new people moving to the state a year. You know, that's about the same size as Boulder, you know. I, th I think Boulder's more We're like 100,000, uh. you know. But you're, you know, just <laughs> take away 20,000 or so, and, and you have about what we're expecting, you know, for the growth of the state of Colorado. Um, you know, the Colorado Water Plan um, highlighted the need of, you know, um, about 400,000 acre feet of additional water storage, as well as looking at um, conservation measures of about 400,000 acre feet. And so, you know, that's, that's a real challenge. We're also looking at climate change and, and the Colorado River is, um, you know, the needs for that by 2050 will be additional 500,000 acre feet alone. And 2.5 million people depend on that water. Mm -hmm. And so, you asked a great question because, you know, how do you solve our, our water challenges? Well, in, in my opinion, and the governor would agree to me, with me, I would say is it's not a, a, a top-down approach, but really a bottom-up approach. And back in 2005, when, when you were a legislator, it's it before I was uh, uh, elected, but it was really Russ George's uh, vision originally, when he was then the Department of Natural Resources Director, to come up with this basin roundtable philosophy, really modeling after, it, uh, after the 1922 um, compact that occurred, where how do you bring basins together? How do you look at um, localized solutions to our water needs and have it bubble up? and then have you know, larger interbasin water compact committees look at statewide solutions. Um, back then, um, you know, I think everyone thought that there was going to be um, basin differences, you know, major issues in, in the state of Colorado. We know it already exists you know, with the West Slope and the Front Range and so forth, but you know, to start with, these, these interbasin roundtables are just so critical to, to help localize um, what the water needs are in those specific areas around the state. The Colorado Water Plan um, that was developed a, a few years ago, you know, the governor highlighted that in his State of the State address. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of my goals, you know, for the DNR, but also for, for water in particular, is to work on ways that we implement the plan. So how do you do that? Well, um, first step, you know, this year the governor actually has um, $30 million line item in the long bill to help towards implementation strategies. He also has um, another $20 million that's associated with, with what's called the, the CWCB Water Projects Bill, the Colorado Water Conservation Projects Bill, which you combine the two of those, you know, that's $50 million, but you know, the need is $100 million. Mm -hmm. And so we are working right now with um, funders, everything from discussions with Gates to um, 
um, you know, the Walton, you know, uh, foundation and working with local municipalities, the water community to, to really figure out, hey, you know, should we explore a statewide, you know, funding solution to come up with $100 million you know, moving forward? Um, I think we're, we're at a, a good stage right now in terms of a foundation. Uh, we have folks that are working really hard at the basin level to look at strategies. We are, are also um, higher level, we're working on a seven state negotiated agreement for the Colorado River right now. And some of you, how many of you are familiar with that? That's been in the news a lot, yeah. So, you know, that's something actually, you'll appreciate this. So like the first week of my job, I was sick as a dog. I had a sinus infection, I had a cold. It, I just felt miserable. And in the first week I had um, my, my first um, COGCC, oil and gas conservation meeting, which is not easy by the way. And the next day I had CWCB hearings. And then the next three days were Colorado Water Congress where we were just in the middle of figuring out was Arizona going to vote on this bill on a drought contingency plan. And it occurred actually Thursday night where everyone you know, saw photos of the governor actually signing the bill. But we're still working on um, Arizona and California are, are very close. And, and then we'll need a bill to get through Congress. But, but the commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation has been very strong uh, with the states to say, hey, we need to have drought contingency measures. And I'm really proud of Colorado because we can like kind of check off the box, if you will, because CWCB, you know, last December voted to approve our drought contingency measures, which looks at conservation issues. That looks at, you know, if there's uh, curtailment issues on the Colorado River, um, how do we pay out potentially ranchers because of prior appropriation, how we encourage people not to use the water um, that they're entitled to. And so at the end of the day, it's, it's a real del delicate balance of looking at um, our Colorado water laws, but also encouraging people not to use water when they don't have to and look at conservation measures and looking at you know, additional storage opportunities. Summit County, we, we turned a 23-acre-foot um, old Dillon Reservoir. Um, so if you're heading west and you're by kind of Silverthorn area, there's a little hill to the left, and that's where the old Dillon Reservoir is. So we turned a little over 20 acre foot reservoir into, um, into it was a, about a 200 acre foot reservoir. So we're working on our localized solution. So you don't need to have huge major trans mountain diversions to really come up with you know, um, some of our water challenges. I feel like a lot of it can be done more at the local level. I'll get this on your schedule now. We're actually going to host, um, we're going to try to host an event around the um, proposed expansion of Gross Reservoir, which is just west of here, in early May. So I'll make sure we get you or someone from your office here yeah, on we're, that. Yeah, we're, we're involved with that a little bit. I yeah. bet you are. <laughs> and, and it's, I mean, th I know the shutdown sometimes feel like it, it, it's not, doesn't really affect your life. And, but, you know, these, these were hard deadlines. And the er state of Arizona was really left without a lot of help from the federal government trying to finalize this because of the shutdown, and they literally signed it, what, the last day in the last hours, or the federal government would intervene, which yeah. we don't want to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now, anyway. Um, and uh, Dan and I, and I'm sure others of you in the room, were at the uh, recent Water Congress meeting, and one of the things I was really excited about there, Water Congress has been around forever. It, the whole look and age and gender of who belongs to the Water Congress has changed a lot since I first got involved. And uh, I was actually on a panel that was talking about climate change. So, I mean, it's, it, you know, the world around water policy in the West has really changed and yeah. it's, it's taken a while, but I feel- It's almost a whole half day on climate change. Yeah. yeah so so that's, that's just really, really good news. Yeah. Um, so I wanna shift to, um, I think, forest health. Okay. Also, of course, affected greatly by um, climate change. So. Uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about um, the department's responsibilities around the forest and what your priorities are? Yeah, well, um, first of all, I've, I've been a certified wildland firefighter since 2006, and I fought fires throughout the West, including here in Boulder County. I was on the, the, the Four Mile Fire on night ops for that. That was, wow. and my friend Commissioner Matt Jones back there is very familiar with that too, with his firefighting credentials. So thank you for your service, Commissioner. Um, that, that felt like the 4th of July. Um, it, it, was, it, was, um, it was intense, to say the least. And, and for the folks that live back in that area, I thought we had a really great team of folks working on that fire. I also fought the um, old stage fire 
um, that was back in, uh, I want to say 2007 or 8, mm -hmm. and that was a very unique fire um, that was actually in, in January. So you think about climate change, uh, we, now the fire season is not just uh, in the summertime, but mm -hmm. it's really all season long. So, you know, thinking of Department of Natural Resources in general, and, and I and mentioned kind of in my introduction, I've, I've worked at the federal, state, and local level, I see a lot of silos when it comes to forest health and kind of emergency preparedness issues. Um, you know, we, I think we have really great federal partners with U.S. Forest Service and BLM. I, I see the, the state playing an important role through the Division of Fire Prevention and Control, uh, really working to train um, local, you know, firefighters. And, and then, you know, the local communities are, are developing what's called community wildfire protection plans, and, and they, you know, look at this kind of localized approach to figure out, hey, with scarce resources, how do we protect critical infrastructure? How do we protect where people live? How do we protect, um, um, you know, just uh, homes and, and people in general? And so what I would like to see, and, in, in, you know, backing up a little bit, when I think of challenges in the state, like this is one issue that keeps me up at night, mm -hmm. um, a, a mega fire in Colorado that could rip through and you know we could see a hundred thousand acre fire and and you look at colorado with you know over a million people that live within this wildland urban interface area where the homes meet the forested or grassland areas it, it's a real issue and so i really want to work hard to just you know pretend that we have no divisions of federal state and private lands because we know we know that wildfires don't know the difference right wildfires don't know the difference between federal state and, and private lands are going to go wherever the wildfire is going to go right and so I think we need a management strategy that really reflects that in Colorado. And, and I want to look through a lens, too, of, of, um, of really wild, wild, uh, watershed protections and, and almost do like a community wildfire protection plan squared um, for the state of Colorado. And we're, we're, we've looked at other communities that have had you know, major fires, and it's almost like the after effect when you look at the water quality and quantity issues that just really can, can put a long-term devastating impact. Mike, you know that from Aurora Water, of course. You know, it's uh, the, the water community. You know, uh, you look at the Hayman Fire and the Buffalo Creek Fire. Denver Water has spent millions and millions of dollars still dealing with remediation, you know, of, of those, you know, fires. So anyways, I'm going to work hard with our, with our federal partners, work hard with our state, um, you know, partners and, and um, and you know, local partners to really figure out a strategy to move forward, to, but develop this you know, almost like a statewide approach of CWPPs and look at where fire behavior has occurred before and, and knowing that there's scarce resources, really you know, how do we just zero in on those areas that are most vulnerable in the state? Mm -hmm. I, I forgot that um, Dan actually brought a little vial of um, pine beetles <laughs> down to the legislature. It's like these little things causing so much trouble. Yeah, and, and in fact, um, I'll just expand on that really quickly. Uh, the, the State Forest Service used to give me these beetles and also would give me other like props. And they gave me um, like a, a stump um, one day. And, you know, it was a blue stained wood, um, you know, when the beetle... Um, attacks a tree, there's a, a fungus that grows throughout that and then, and then it more or less suffocates the tree. It, it can't um, get the, the water nutrients it needs and the tree dies. Um, but um, anyways, this was I think maybe February or so, um, we started noticing in my office that there were like flies in the <laughs> office. And, <laughs> and it started to get worse and worse. And, and so my aide actually asked, um, you know, the, you know, someone, hey, what is going on in here? So an exterminator came in, and the fly started to go into Senator Greg Brophy's office, too, in the corner. And, and so the, the beetles, actually, since it was situated in an area that was just really sunny on the west side and the third floor of the Capitol, the beetles thought it was the summertime, and they actually hatched in the Capitol. And so sometimes, you know, I, I used to carry around these beetles with me, <laughs> Because, you know, when you represent different parts of the state, you have to bring awareness to, to issues that, you know, folks maybe in Denver may not be aware of the issues of, of forest health and the fact we have millions of acres of dead trees and Summit County 156,000 acres. But, but it was kind of a unique way to bring um, the issue of forest health to actually have the beetles hatch <laughs> in the Capitol. And, I had um, not heard that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> um, and somewhat relatedly, I, yeah. and we have 41 state parks. Uh, there was a great article in uh, the magazine 5280, I think it was called Loving Our Lands or Loving Our Parks yeah. to Death, and did a great analysis of overcrowding of, of the state parks and Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, and I know it's a big issue and you are in charge of that, so I wonder if you wanted to talk about um, the overcrowding and then the other challenges on the issue around parks. Yeah, you know, first of all, let me start with uh, the funding challenge that we have for, for just like, uh, in general, uh, Parks and Wildlife Division. I have um, six main divisions and then eight if you include forestry and avalanche within the Department of Natural Resources, but uh, Parks and Wildlife is, is almost totally dependent on, um, on fees, on hunting and fishing licenses. You know, we have about 900 employees um, but, you know, to have a department that's so dependent on hunting and fishing licenses is really scary. Many other western states are, are challenged with the same, you know, issue where, I mentioned before, you have this, you know, huge growth of people coming in and, you know, not everyone's buying hunting and fishing licenses. But how many of you are buying, you know, hiking shoes and backpacks and, and tents and other ways to get outside and enjoy the, the outdoors? Well, most, probably everyone in the room is doing that. Um, and so, Moving forward, that's one of the governor's you know, major priorities he wants me to work on is this you know, diversification of funds. Mm -hmm. But since it is an enterprise status, you know, there are challenges within that. You can't just you know, increase you know, general fund dollars, for example, because um, that could interfere with the enterprise status. Um, but I'm kicking around ideas of everything from looking at um, you know, new foundation, uh, possibly, to uh, maybe a little bit of general fund dollars, but, but also maybe like a statewide discussion on how we fund you know, our natural resources and our trails in the state of Colorado, maybe a, uh, a sales tax or something like that down the road. Um, Which we, would require we, a vote, too, yeah, so it's tough. Exactly. We are really you know, uh, loving in many ways our natural resources to death. Um, you all know this in Boulder County very well. Um, how many of you live in the El Dorado Canyon area? Yeah. What, what's going on there? <laughs> and you're, you're really for it, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so that, that's just one example of a, of a topic that I'm working on. Very nice season. <laughs> Right, right. Without any additional so, so let me tell you some numbers, and you all know that, that live there, but just a couple years ago, we went from um, a little over 200,000 people visiting the park to last year, the numbers were over 500,000. And, and so that's a huge growth, you know, just, just with that. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful area, you all know that. It's, it's a mecca for, for climbing. And, and folks that visit, you know, know that you have to be careful when you drive because there's going to be someone belaying, you know, right on, right on the street, you know, and you want to get around. Well, that's, it's, it's challenging. Um, but that particular proposal is part of a um, 16 and 16 project that Governor Hickenlooper proposed to have these better trail connectivities around the state of Colorado. And, um, and, and you know, most of the projects are great. And I don't want to discount this particular project, so I think it, it does have some merits, but um, chatted with Commissioner Jones um, earlier today and some of the other commissioners about really look, taking a, a little step back and figuring out, let's look at growth for that park, let's look at the impacts to that local community, let's make sure there's parking available, let's make sure um, we understand you know, why people are coming you know, before you add something new to the equation um, that will bring more people in. So, it's something that I think it's a, a good model to really look at for, the, for other areas around, around Colorado that um, in my own county, Mount Quandry is one of the busiest 14ers in the state. So any given weekend, and I'm an avid trail runner, so if, I'm, you know, if I want to run that early in the morning, Johanna, I leave at what, four in the morning um, so I can get a, a parking spot there. Because uh, if you leave at eight in the morning or something like that, well, you have to park, you know, two miles away, you know, on Highway 9, where it's really not safe. And so there's an effort, I actually met with folks today, of, of leaders from Boulder County, from Clear Creek County, from Gilpin County, the U.S. Forest Service, um, foundations that, that, that are really concerned about the state of Colorado and how um, we want to make sure that, you know, businesses come to Colorado and so forth. 
but, but make sure we're not loving our resources to death and make sure we're really managing it for the future. Yeah. It's not, it's not easy, but. Yeah, yeah. You're, um, you're facing just challenges on, on every single division in the, in the department. So um, now I want to turn to Easier what topics and I <laughs> think is the most exciting changes that Colorado is looking at right now. And I don't know how many of you heard this, but just today, this afternoon, um, Casey Becker and Steve Fenberg, uh, representative and senator from here, um, announced uh, the big omnibus oil and gas bill. So uh, we, those who care about this have been um, waiting for this for a while. I'm, I have some bullet points that I stole out of the um, newspaper article. I know you're more aware of this, but just to give you all um, um, kind of a heads up of what it's dealing with. <clears throat> So um, specifically making oil and gas proposals more subject to municipal and county zoning and land use restrictions. In other words, local control. So cities and counties will have much more power uh, to deal directly with oil and gas drilling companies, including greater setbacks if they so choose. Um, reforming the mission of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. And I'm gonna ask Dan to explain the um, and structure hierarchy of power too. Um, they oversee the permitting process um, so they're going to change the duty from fostering development, that's the word that's been in statute, to regulating it, um, which will have mm -hmm. a lot of impact. Um, also, um, making the commission give more weight to potential threats to public health, safety, and the environment when considering drilling proposals. Um, and um, there's something called, been going on that's called force pooling. So if you have an area of land where you know, a com company is going to try to drill, if they just had permission from one um, mineral owner, they could force everyone else to be part of that drilling process called force pooling. That has changed, will change, hopefully, um, and that will change to you need more than 50% of the mineral, um, the owners of the, um, they need to either own or be able to lease more than 50% of the mineral acres, which is just a huge change. So it's a big, bold bill, um, and um, they just announced it today. Um, and I'm, I know there'll be lots of probably lawsuits and all kinds of support and all kinds of uh, fighting over it. Um, so let's, let's step back though a little bit. Let's just talk about the uh, power structure at DNR so folks understand yeah. that. Well, uh, yeah, let me first maybe say too, if it's all right, uh, sure. you have two very bold legislators representing you in Boulder County with Senator Fenberg and, and Speaker Casey Becker. Um, any kind of reform for oil and gas is, is not easy. Um, we really haven't seen this kind of reform since 1950. And we know that it, things have changed dramatically to say the least. So um, having those two folks in leadership, having a governor like Jared Polis that said on day one, on campaigning and when he would be governor, he was gonna work to reform the COGCC. And, and he has played a, a real critical role in, in directing me and my staff to be um, to, to work in that fashion. So what we've done, even you know, before a bill was even introduced, we my, my first day on the job, we hired uh, Jeff Robbins to be the the director of the COGCC. Um, how many of you are familiar with Jeff Robbins? Yeah, Jeff, you know, has worked with a lot of uh, municipalities in Colorado on the Front Range and Western Slope to figure out local regulations. On, on how you can really look at more kind of local control. So he's, he's, um, he's uh, out of um, Durango. He, he used to have a private practice. Now he's full-time oil and gas, more or less advisor mm -hmm. uh, to the governor. Uh, when it, when, during the campaign, when, when oil and gas wanted to meet with the governor, um, he didn't bring me, he didn't bring folks from, from his you know, congressional staff. He brought Jeff Robbins. So he's very, very well respected and just a, a really wonderful person that knows oil and gas in and out. So, so with the new director, that definitely brought you know, some change as well, even though you know, we're still working under the landscape of what the state law tells us that we can work under. But, but, but there's things that he can do administratively as, as the, the, the acting director. And let me share with you just kind of what we've already uh, put in place, you know, even before this bill. And, and there's a long list, there's about 18 different areas of what, what I call it new operating protocols for, for oil and gas in Colorado. But let me just rattle off a couple key points here. 
Um, so, so in the past, if you had um, what was called 2A or 2B wells for the permitting component, uh, it was a simple press a button and accept. Literally, press a button and accept. And these are considered non-controversial. However, these are areas that are potentially in areas that are sensitive to, to watersheds. It could be close to wetlands area. It could be close to schools. Um, and so the fact that we've had just kind of this process of accept, 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 in my opinion, is, is very disturbing. And so, so, so the new, some of the new operating protocols that we have in place right now is everything from wells located within 1,500 feet of a residence that gets a higher level of scrutiny where instead of just accept, Jeff Robbins is really taking a look at this to making sure it's okay. Number two, wells located within municipalities. We know that, um, you know, thinking of, you know, local control and so forth, local municipalities want to know what's going on, you know, within their um, uh, geographical area. Number three, well uh, located um, within a school setback area. And then also, wells located within um, critical, you know, habitat areas. In particular, looking at sage grouse and bald eagle um, areas. Again, there's about 18 different other areas within that. But so that's been in place for uh, about a week and a half now, mm -hmm. which in my opinion, just again, you know, really exciting. If, 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 you, if, if you're not, if, if you're satisfied with the status quo, you're, you're not happy right now, you know, but if you want change, if you want to have a higher level of environmental protection, then, then you should be very happy. Alice mentioned some of the key components of the bill. The bill will, will either be introduced tomorrow or or Monday, it's, it's within the next few days. And so I don't wanna go over all the components of the bill um, out of respect to the bill sponsors, um, but you mentioned some, some, some key components that the governor and the legislators you know, highlighted. You know, big picture, you know, it looks at you know, expansive authority to local governments to regulate oil and gas operations, including land use, surface impacts, siting, water quality, air quality, um, that local communities can have a higher level of environmental protection than the state if they want to. You know, for the county commissioners and former county commissioners like, you know, former Commissioner Heath and, 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 and Commissioner Jones up there, are there any other former or current county commissioners here? I don't see in the room. But, but you all know it's, it's nuts and bolts as county commissioners land use authority. You know, when, when there's a hotel that's proposed, that, that in an unincorporated area and they say, okay, well, we wanna have um, eight stories tall and we're proposing a certain amount of parking spots and we think it should be here or there. As county commissioners, we say, hey, not right there, but maybe over here. You know, not this tall, maybe this height. Not this size, maybe this size. It's, it's all about, you know, th that local kind of land use authority provisions that this bill will give not only counties, but also municipalities which is a game changer. It also changes the COGCC mandate, you know, from fostering oil and gas development to administering oil and gas development in a manner that protects public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife. And so um, it, it's really, again, it's, it's a game changer. It's, it's um, um, as someone that, that always thinks about the next generation of, of, of protecting the environment, um, it's something that I, I think oil and gas um, can, can still exist in Colorado. They can still make money. But in the future, if this bill passes, they're going to do things in a different way um, that you have to have environmental protections in the mix. And how many of you like to hear that? Is that good? Yeah. Okay, good, good. That's what I want to see. How many people don't? <laughs> it's all right. You can raise your hand, yeah. Um, but you know the legislators and the governor have had you know numerous meetings with with oil and gas folks. I met with uh, Western Slope oil and gas operators today. You know, um, depending on where you're at in the state, oil and gas is very different too. You know, I learned today for the first time the Western Slope they actually reuse their water, um, where the Front Range they just don't. It just it just goes on the surface. Um, and so you know there are best management practices that we can bring forward for Colorado that I think will be you know, really positive. Um, my buddy, Doug Vilsax in the corner, he's my legislative liaison. Raise your hand, Doug. He's a graduate here of the law school. He's a rock star. He's been really um, working on, on this as well, you know, with me and the team, really understanding 
um, how we're helpful to the governor's office, how we're help, helpful to, to the legislators to, to make this bill a reality. And, um, you know, it's not a done deal. We're, we're, we're unique. You have um, Democrat control of the House and Senate. Um, but the Senate is, is very similar to Senator Heath and I when we were there. It's just the majority of, of a couple. And so it just takes a, a couple, you know, Democratic um, uh, senators to vote no, and you could find yourself with a situation where you don't get the bill passed, you know. And so I really urge you all to, you know, connect with Senator Fenberg and, and the Speaker to say, hey, how can I be helpful? Because uh, it's definitely not a done deal. There's a lot of work that, that needs to be done soon. I wish I could give you all the specifics of the bill, but out of respect for, for the legislators, I, I think I'll leave it at that. And there, and I just briefly looked at the news coverage, so I suggest you all, you know, follow it over the next few days. And um, there was uh, some um, complaints about it from oil and gas industry and how it was characterized. And I know the Sierra Club was supporting it. And some people will probably feel like it doesn't do enough, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's it's a start, and you know, and there may be other bills, um, but I think I. I think it's probably a good start, and implementation will be complex, yeah. and it'll take some some time. But um, I think it's um, it, it certainly fits in with what Governor Polis said he wanted to do. Um, and paired with that, he also has some. And I don't know if you know the numbers, but he hired Will Tour uh, to run the uh, Colorado Energy Office, and there's some pretty uh, progressive goals around where we will get our energy in Colorado, or, um, percentages renewables by 2040, I think. I can't remember. 20, 2015, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, we've talked about for probably far too long, in my personal opinion, you know, this bridge, you know, oil and gas is a bridge fuel. Um, you know, I think we're about crossed the bridge. So. You know, it's, 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 Thinking of you know renewables, uh, it's 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 the governor's you know one of his top priorities is to move towards this 100% renewable uh, goal for Colorado, and it's it's very ambitious, and he wants all of our divisions to re be thinking about that. And so, um, you know, one of my divisions is state land board, and um, looking at Wendy here, who works for state land board, but there's you know opportunities that, that we can look at what sta state land assets are to really capitalize on potential you know large scale solar you know farms that, that could be on state lands. And, uh, and I think do you that's want to really explain what the yeah. state land board land is? It's, it's yeah, it's held. Uh, it, the money that's raised goes to schools. Yeah, and it's held in trust, and it's exactly. in our constitution. Yeah, it's in our constitution. Uh, the board members are, are selected by the governor. But, but the goal of it is to, is to bring in money for K through 12 education. So they do that in a variety of different ways, and including oil and gas development, depending on where you're at in Colorado. But it's definitely something that the governor really wants us to look at, you know, that, that particular division to figure out, you know, how can we work with his goals and, and implement new strategies on, on how that state land board can utilize um, the land that may be not used in the way that the governor wants it to be used. So, for example, um, two major goals, you know, re renewable energy goals, and he also has a goal of looking at um, K through 12 education uniform across the state. Well, if we have uniform, um, oh, excuse me, um, kindergarten education, I mean, not K. Um, and so if we have, you know, we're going to need more kindergarten teachers if that's going to be uniform um, all day, you know, kindergarten. And, and so we have a huge you know, challenge for housing. Um, it doesn't matter where you live, whether you're in Boulder or Denver or in the West Slope. So are there opportunities to utilize state land board to do workforce housing for teachers, for example? Um, are there ways to utilize state land board to, again, you know, look at large scale you know, re renewable energy projects? Um, you know, I think there are ways that we can, we can do that. Mm -hmm. so, and also utilizing uh, parks and wildlife as well. Yeah. So. And it just reminds me when you mentioned parks and wildlife, another reason why Tabor is so horrible. Um, you mentioned <laughs> enterprise zones, and I don't know if everyone knows what that means, but um, we've set up, you know, in some ways sort of this fiction. We'll, we'll create something called an enterprise, like higher ed, which means they can't get any more than 10% of their budget from the state. Of course, CU only gets like 4% of their budget from the state now, but um, so uh, parks and rec can't get more than 10%. Um, of the revenue from the state, or it would, or it would go above this 10% limit for enterprise zones. So, just my um, editorial comment on Tabor. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, you know, really quick too, since I was thinking of looking over at you because you work for State Land Board, but you know, another priority that the governor wants me to work on is, is protecting our public lands, but also um, looking at new opportunities to open up lands for people. And State Land Board is another great opportunity where, where potentially you could have State Land Board land that's adjacent to U.S. Forest Service or BLM, or it could be a county open space component that if you just have everyone talking together, you could really unleash you know, new areas for you know, outdoor recreation potentially. And so we're gonna take a close look at that okay. as well. Okay. Yeah, so. um, I think, um, are there any, and we can come back to some closing remarks, but I'd like to open it up for Q&A. And, and it's, I think it's the crowd's probably easy enough where if someone wants to just um, stand up and say the question, I'll repeat it to make sure everyone hears it. And we did wanna take a couple of questions from students first. So, student? Okay. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you don't think that translation diversions are necessary to solve urban water problems, but the proposal to set the diversion persists. So in the meantime, while we're figuring out the reservoirs and whatnot, do you see any role for the state in providing legal protection or support for communities who are trying to protect their water from such diversions? So the question, just to get it on, on the, because we do record this, was about trans-basin diversions. Was oh, recorded? Oh, no, yeah. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's uh, all right. <laughs> I don't know if I could repeat the whole thing. So, <laughs> but um, I just want to give the topic, and then you can. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, um, I, I have two water divisions within the Department of Natural Resources. One is Colorado Water Conservation Board. The other is Division of Water Resources, otherwise known as the State Engineer's Office. So, um, the State Engineer's Office is is the entity that looks at you know implementing Colorado water law, and so you know if there's any proposal for um, for example, the, the San Luis Valley, there was um, a Rio Grande water, you're familiar, were you down there for the hearing? For the? Uh, not for the hearing. Okay, yeah. Um, or, I mean, for the, for the symposium. Um, but there's a, there's a proposal, actually, that, that some folks are working on, including former Governor Owens as part of this group, um, that's looking at, at diverting uh, 22,000 acre feet of water from the San Luis Valley and, and pumping it eventually over Pancha Pass into the Front Range. Um, the folks in the San Luis Valley, you know, do not like that. Um, I would say it's safe to say that um, the governor and other policymakers have, have real concerns, but whoever owns those water rights, too, they're entitled to go through a process through Division of Water Resources to explore whether or not what's legal, what's not. And so, you know, they're the entity that do all the processing. And so, you know, any, any major water project in the state has to go through that Division of Water Resources. And, um, you know, I have to be very careful in, in my role to, to, you know, not take positions on potential, you know, on, on water projects that are, you know, maybe that are definitely through in an application process now. But things are not in the works yet, you know, I still have to be careful as well because uh, ex parte and you can look at um, the quasi-judicial nature of, of land use issues um, within water. So, um, so yeah, we, you know, we look at that closely. Um, for the governor to take an active stance on a particular you know, water proposal, um, I would advise him to be very careful about that, you know, especially if it's, depending on where it's at, if it's within water court or if it's an application process, you know, within, within the division of um, water resources, I would advise them to say no, because it just, that process needs to take its course. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just blanket water law, you know, making sure things are compliant. After that, then the politics can occur of whether or not it's really a good idea or not, but it's, it's they just look at, you know, nonpartisan, is this consistent with Colorado water law? Uh, any other student questions right here? Oh, no, not a student. <laughs> Any other students? Anything on wildlife issue? No. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go here. And I know Bob Hallman, one of our senior fellows, had a good question. He asked me earlier. I want to make sure I call on him later.
so the question real quick, I'll just repeat it shortly, was about um, population growth and particularly um, in uh, relation to parks and wildlife and um, how you'll be protecting that mm -hmm. in relation to growth and, and corridor protection as well? I think it's a very important topic to start with and I think we can do more you know, with wildlife corridors. In, in Summit County, we actually uh, were able to work with multiple different partners, including Parks and Wildlife. Um, uh, Summit County government pitched in, uh, we, we, when I was a former county commissioner, about $500,000 on this project. Paul Tudor Jones, um, um, very wealthy landowner that owns the Blue Valley Ranch, pitched in $5 million. Um, uh, federal partners were involved with that as well, nonprofits to look at both overpass and underpass areas. There's been a real challenge in certain areas around the state of, of wildlife, um, uh, of deaths, um, because of um, you know, um, management challenges of, of wildlife. Um, so I think in, in the big picture of safety, I think it's very important um, for, for wildlife protection. I think it's important as well. Um, and I think as we move forward, we need to work with federal, state, nonprofits that, who do you work for again? Uh, the Endangered Species Coalition. Okay, yeah, you know, coalitions like that where, where we can, you know, um, and I've already had, you know, some meetings. We already have Parks and Wildlife staff that are working on that too. So, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, then you would have an executive order, you know, really highlighting from the governor, you know, this is our plan moving forward, looking at wildlife corridors. And, and I would like to get to that point. I think that'd be very exciting. But you know, it's, it's not just my department, but you know, um, uh, Colorado Department of Transportation would have to play a huge role in this as well. But it's, it's very doable, and I think it'd be exciting to work on. And I'm happy to work with you on that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, Bob, do you, have, you remember your question that you asked me earlier? Sure. And I like this because it had to do actually with existing law that wasn't necessarily yeah. followed. <laughs> The, the number one priority right now is to get this bill through. And, and if we get this through, it's, it's a game changer in how we do things in Colorado. Um, you know, some of the, 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 the new operating protocols that I mentioned, and I'm happy to, you know, offline get you a list of some of those. I'm happy to get, get you those. Um, but the number one priority is this bill. If that doesn't work out for some reason, um, we can explore, you know, rulemaking authorities. I mean, a big picture, you know, we get this bill through, and then it's almost like the real work begins with the rulemaking process, and because and, that's quite lengthy. But, you know, best management practices are, are always important. You know, with my meeting earlier today with Western Slope oil and gas operators, you know, just thinking about how they reuse water, and I asked, you know, hey, how many of you are doing that? And they said, well, we're all doing it. I was like, wow, that's news to me. That's great. That's, that's almost put that in law that you have to do that, you know, but, um, but yeah, we can explore, you know, ways to, to utilize best management practices. And that was actually um, what I used when uh, worked on a bill called the Colorado Wildlife Habitat um, Stewardship Act back when I was a state rep. Mm -hmm. and, and that was looking at best management practices and um, taking wildlife into account when, when developing oil and gas. And, um, and so there's a rulemaking process that occurred after that bill on utilizing, you know, instead of, um, dr you know, horizontal uh, drilling, you know, using directional drilling and so forth. And instead of having multiple well pads, you know, go from one well pad and have, you can have, you know, anywhere from 15 to 50 different wells just from that one well pad. So, you know, that's a strategy too, because you look in the Western Slope especially, I've done, how many of you ever done like an aerial analysis of the West Slope, some of you? Yeah, of course you, Scott, but you actually facilitate those trips. Um, but it's, it's crazy to look at, it's like a spider web everywhere where the roads and everything leading and, um, and ways that we can minimize the footprint I think is huge to move forward. Yeah, yeah there's been this sort of catch-22 around um, adopting new technologies 
because if it's proven that it works, then the company's like, well, we don't, we don't want to do it because then we'll have to do it. We don't even want to know if it works because then we'll have to do it. <laughs> so hopefully we can get to the point where you know, emissions control and, and those types of technologies are um, part of this new analysis of uh, how permitting is going to happen. So. I mean, the, the status quo is, is working just fine for the industry. And literally, you know, and, and until there's a real meaningful bill, um, the status quo is just going to occur. Um, you know, looking at what we can do without statute, it's limiting. You know, best management practice is important, but, you know, it's, um, you know, making sure that everyone's on the same page, that's a real challenge. Um, I, I had someone, uh, here you go. Thank you. Are you familiar with your Mine Land Reclamation Board? I never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am, I am, of course. They have ultimate responsibility and authority for reclamation plans yeah. after a mine has been closed. Yeah. And just south of Boulder, we have this great gravel pit, mm -hmm. well, the gravel pit, where it was in the South Boulder Creek floodplain, and they removed 4 million cubic yards of sand and gravel, mm -hmm. lowering the topography of about 15 feet. Mm -hmm. And there was an excellent reclamation plan in place because both the county and the city liked retaining and maintaining natural floodplains in like arid areas. But when the University of Colorado purchased that gravel pit, they wanted, the region wanted to build a 6,000 foot earthen levee mm. around the gravel pit to mm. keep the water out of the land so it can be developed for future intensive development. Mm. There was a temporary um, gravel part of the levee uh, for the gravel operations which was supposed to be removed. Well, University of Colorado went before the Mine Land Reclamation Board, and contrary to the wishes of the county, and contrary to the wishes of the city, they got that 6,000 foot earthen level, which is about 10, 15 feet high, mm -hmm. approved mm -hmm. to divert the water away from the natural floodplain or area mm -hmm. into neighboring uh, communities. Um, and the Mine Land Reclamation Board Well, you know, overall, you know, thinking of that, that division, uh, not just uh, oil and gas, but, but that's also another, you know, division that, as you know, I have oversight over. Um, from day one, and Doug knows this, you know, I said there's um, new boss in town, more or less. New governor, new head of DNR, we're going to try to do things differently. We're going to have a much higher level standard of environmental protections. We're going to look through a different lens. And, and we're going to do that. That's, you know, I've been on the job for one month now. Um, what I see as big problems, I guess in general, um, you look at all the different divisions that I have oversight over, and the governor makes appointments on who those people are. Some have term limits, some don't. I mean, most, most of them have term limits, but more or less they serve at the pleasure of the governor in many ways. Um, but, but some, some of these um, divisions I have oversight, you have, um, you don't really, for the commissioners in the room, you don't really have like master plans that, that are like visionary documents in terms of like, you know, hey, how does this mesh with a local community? You have instead rules. And it's really hard, my first oil and gas uh, conservation commission hearing, you know, we had, it was a fight between Anadarko and Bonanza Oil for four and a half hours, and, and there was no visionary document, it was just a, a rule that, that more or less, you know, one person didn't want the other to drill in that location. And so, you know, I, I'll get more familiar with, with the rules, but, but really working with the new boards, understanding there's a new administration, working with local communities, I think is so important. You know, I've, I, again, I was elected three times as a county commissioner and, and really hearing what, what happens on the local level, what happens to people where there's mining or oil and gas, you know, in your backyard, that means a lot to me. Um, you know, I, I, I live in Breckenridge where I don't, I don't have that, but I can only imagine what, what that'd mean to my family, um, what that'd mean to my little kids. The impact is, is real. So you should know that as a new director, I'm, I'm going to look through a lens of, of what that really means to local communities moving forward. And you have my commitment to do that. So um, it's almost 20 till. I know we started a little bit late. And just so you know, right in the room next door, we have. <coughs> 
refreshments, beer and wine, and we will con continue these conversations. So I'd like to just take one more question and then we can um, head into the next room. How about right here in, in the middle? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I, lived, I lived in Gunnison as a kid, you know, so I know Paonia very well. What a beautiful place. You must be, you're, you're lucky to live there, and you know that, right? <laughs> um, you know, you, you live in a county. You live in a town. You're going to have a seat at the table, you know, with oil and gas moving forward. It doesn't matter where you live in the state of Colorado. If Paonia wants to have a higher level of environmental standard than what the state is proposing, you can do that. I need your help getting this bill through. So, We're working on it. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll just leave it at that, you know. You're, you're not left out. It doesn't matter where you live in the state of Colorado, um, whether it's unincorporated or in a municipal area, you're going to have a seat at the table if that community wants to. So, yeah. Dan, was there anything else you wanted to touch on before we wrap up? And then, like I said, we can retire. Yeah, retire yeah. Next um, it's... Well, I just want to say, yeah, thank you so much, obviously, for, for having me. It's like a huge, huge honor when you first approached me about this. It's been really um, so honored. Um, and I'm so brand spanking new on the job. You know, I'm still getting to know a lot of people. I still haven't been able to make it even to different locations that I have oversight over. Um, so I'm really working hard on that. But it's a, it's a, it's a, a unique opportunity to, to work for a governor that's, again, bold and, and very visionary on natural resources. Um, um, but there's one person in the room that there's a huge sacrifice for me to do this, and that's my wife and my kids. And um, I do my best. We, 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 we decided not to move our family to Denver. Uh, we want to raise our kids in, in Summit County. It's a wonderful, wonderful community. But um, I don't know. Can't do this without you, Johanna. So I love you. All right. Thank you. All right, let's go get a beer. <laughs>